Part 2. 1923. Putsch. After the defeat of Germany in 1918, the resulting chaos threw up a number of minor political parties and splinter groups, now more or less forgotten. Amongst them was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, founded in 1919 by Anton Drexler and Dietrich Erhardt. With its cunningly chosen populist policies, a windy mixture of nationalism, socialism and above all anti-Semitism, the party enjoyed a modest success in the early 20s, thanks mainly to the rabble-rousing abilities of an ex-serviceman called Adolf Hitler, or Hitler. The party held a number of meetings in the beer halls of Munich, most of them ending in battles between National Socialist supporters and their communist opponents. However, the new party ruined whatever hopes it might have had of lasting political success with a ludicrously inept and ill-timed attempt at a political coup in Munich in September 1923, which led eventually to the newborn party being banned. Enlisting the support of the old, confused, now almost senile war hero, General Ludendorff, the man Hitler led an armed rabble of followers in a march on the war ministry. From Ballots, Blood and Bullets, Political Chaos in Post-War Germany, by Professor Karl Müller, published Berlin, 1927. This work was suppressed, and its author executed when the National Socialist Party came to power in 1933. 1. Interlude The doctor was hunched over the time path indicator, studying the bright green trace. We overshot a little last time. We need to go back. Ace was slumped in the chair, beating brick dust out of her clothes. How far back? That's just the trouble. A slight miscalculation, and we could end up arguing with Attila the Hun. I thought you'd given up Nitro 9. Well, you know how it is, Professor, said Ace uneasily. Do I? I was pottering about in the TARDIS lab, just doodling, really. A pinch of this, a few grains of that. Before I knew where I was... I know. Nitro 9. Nitro 9A, actually, Ace said proudly. New and improved with added pizzazz. Concentrated, too. Twice the whammy for half the weight. She fished in her pocket and produced three large glass marbles. The doctor regarded them with suspicion. Is it any more stable? Well, marginally. It takes a severe impact to detonate. You have to chuck it, not just drop it. The doctor shuddered. How many have you got? Just the three now. I only had time to make four. Well, put them away and wrap them in your hanky or something. By the way, thanks. My pleasure. Professor, I didn't tell you. Tell me what? On my way to the storeroom, I, I thought I saw a TARDIS. Another TARDIS, dematerialising in one of the corridors. Good grief. Are you sure? Ace shrugged. Dunno. I thought I saw a flash of blue and heard the sound, but when I went to look, there was nothing there. For a moment, I thought you'd left without me. The doctor frowned. Could have been temporal refraction, a freak foreshadowing of our own departure. Odd, though. Still, nothing we can do about it now. He made a minute adjustment to the controls. Well, that's the best I can do, he patted the console. The rest is up to you, old girl. Ace could never quite get used to the way the Doctor treated the TARDIS like an intelligent living being. You're letting the TARDIS decide where we go? Not entirely. I'm using the time path indicator to lead us into the right spatio-temporal segment and leaving the TARDIS to do the fine tuning. How will it... She whispered the doctor. If you hurt her feelings, she'll sulk. Ace gave him a look. How will she know? The time worm still has parts of the TARDIS within herself, remember, and I have a time worm implant lodged in the telepathic circuits. TARDIS and time worm are linked. Since I'm linked to the TARDIS, I'm linked to the time worm as well. Forever? Until one or the other of us is destroyed, said the doctor matter-of-factly. So the TARDIS can always take us to the Time Worm? Well, that's what I'd hoped. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be quite that precise. How do you mean? Well, let's say, wherever the TARDIS takes us, the Time Worm won't be far away, or we'll be arriving sometime soon. Or we'll have left quite some time ago, suggested Ace. Hence our little trip to occupied Britain. The Doctor nodded. Let's hope we have better luck this time. He knelt down and began rooting through a little used storage locker in the base of the console, emerging eventually with a dusty stone pot. There you are, Ace. Something for your sore nose and fat lip. She unscrewed the lid. Oh, it's almost empty, Doctor. There's just a little dab of some kind of cream left in the bottom. A little dab is all you need. Try it. All right. I need to clean up anyway. I might have a swim as well. After a quick dip in the TARDIS pool, Ace returned to her quarters for a shower and a change of clothes. She was about to leave when she saw the doctor's stone pot standing on her dressing table. She put a little of the cream on the end of her finger and smoothed it into her nose and upper lip. The results were astonishing. The redness and soreness vanished straight away, and her skin looked not only as good, but better than before. Still clutching the pot, she rushed back into the main control room, where the doctor stood brooding over the console, comparing its readings with those of the time path indicator. This stuff's terrific, Professor! Where on earth do you get it? Where on Khan, you mean? She studied the symbols carved round the side of the pot. What does all this mean? The doctor took the pot. It's old high Gallifreyan. It says, Dr. Solon's special Morbius lotion, guaranteed to contain genuine elixir of life, manufactured under licence by the Sisterhood of Khan. Well, it's terrific. You could make a fortune. I doubt it. The production rate's too low. They only make one pot every hundred years. The rise and fall of the central column was starting to slow down. Nice timing, Ace, said the Doctor. We're nearly there. Nearly where, Professor? And nearly when? That, my dear Ace, is very much the question. The Doctor took his black leather coat from the hat stand. This will probably still be in fashion, he nodded towards the hat stand. I got you something suitable from the wardrobe room. Ace took down a fawn trench coat and a soft brown felt hat and put them on. How do I look, Professor? Romantic and mysterious. Ace studied herself in the long mirror. I look like Marlena Dietrich on a bad day, Professor. What? If we're landing in Germany, they'll all be talking German, won't they? It seems very likely. Well, I skived off most of my German lessons and... I never even took the exam. Don't worry, you'll manage. You always do, don't you? You didn't take O-level cheetah, either. I suppose you speak fluent German. I speak fluent everything, said the doctor. Come on, we've arrived. <laughs>